How long will you run? Before you realize... He's faster. Well, hey everyone, thanks so much for joining us today. Wherever you're watching from, we consider you to be like family to us. So we're, we're a church who cares about what's going on outside our walls and our community and in our world as much as we care about what's happening inside. And so welcome to week three of our series called Stop Running. Uh, it's a cautionary tale from the life of Jonah. Now, we all know from history class that Thomas Edison invented the light bulb in 1879, and, and since there was no such thing as mass production at the time, each bulb had to be made by hand, and it took his whole labor force 24 straight hours of meticulous, painstaking work to make just one light bulb. Now, James Newton tells a story about a time when Edison's team had just completed the, the fabrication of one of these, these bulbs, 24 hours of work. Edison himself handed it to a young boy who was interning in the lab to carry it up the stairs to another part of the facility. Needless to say, each bulb was very, very precious, and the boy knew it. And so step by step, he cautiously stared at his hands, obviously frightened of dropping such a priceless piece of work. Now, you probably guess where this is going. The boy was concentrating so hard on, on not dropping the bulb from his hands that he forgot to watch his feet, and he tripped at the top of the steps and dropped the bulb, and it shattered all over the facility. And, and I just ask, have you ever been there? Have you ever feel like, you know, felt like you blew your big shot? Like you had one job, and, and you even screwed that up. Do I have any light bulb droppers in the room today? Yeah, me too. Well, back to Edison's lab, it took the entire team 24 more hours to make another bulb. And finally, when they finished and exhausted from such tedious work, Edison was ready to, to send the next bulb upstairs. And so who did he give it to? You might think that after the first disaster, he, would, he wouldn't trust anybody but himself to carry it up. But instead, Edison gave it to that same young boy who had dropped the bulb the first time. Edison knew that the boy was probably devastated by that first incident. And so he decided to give the boy a second chance. Ever gotten a second chance? How about a fifth chance or a 50th chance or a 500th? Like some of you, when it comes to your faith, you feel like you've dropped the light bulb too many times for God to want to use you anymore. Like you, you, you really let your faith, faith slide recently, or you can't master that habit, or maybe God could never forgive you for those college years and you dropped the bulb too much. Well, you're in good company today with our friend Jonah. He had really made a mess of things. Back in chapter 1, we read that, that God gave Jonah the prophet an assignment to go to the evil Assyrians in Nineveh and warn them that God's judgment was coming. Sounds about as fun as a root canal. And so Jonah, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 says this. It says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. And so God said, Go, but we found Jonah said, No. And he hopped on a boat going the opposite direction. He didn't want anything to do with Nineveh. Jonah was running away, but God sent a huge storm. And Jonah got thrown overboard, and then the Lord provided a great fish that swallowed Jonah, and he spent three days and three nights in the belly of this fish. And last week, we examined his prayer together and his return to obedience. And the last verse of chapter 2 said that the Lord spoke to the fish, and the fish vomited Jonah up on the shore. And that's where we pick up the story today. Jonah had dropped the light bulb big time. But here's what I want you to see today. It's my big idea, that when God gives you a second chance, take it. Run with it. Don't shy away. Don't back down. He's a good God, rich in mercy, gracious to sinners. Take him up on the mulligan. So I want to look today at Jonah chapter 3, starting in verse 1. And I want you to see four ways to make good on a second chance. All right, here's the first one that I want you to see. It's to be prepared when God gives you a do-over. Look at verse 1 of chapter 3. It says, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. Time. Help me out here. The word of the Lord came to Jonah the what? Right, the second time. This is one of the most amazing character qualities of God. Aren't you grateful for second chances? Like some of you have stumbled into church today from a mess that you've made. 
And in the back of your head, you're thinking, you know, I think this time I've gone too far. Will God ever take me back? And the answer is yes. Yes, he will. He's done it again and again for people who have done far worse than you. And so the question is, how can we prepare for a do-over? I think chapter two last week showed us Jonah's preparation. His mess led him to self-reflection. It led him to prayer. It led him to acknowledge the greatness of God and, and, and his own failings. He, he didn't let his difficult situation embitter him or drive him away from God. Instead, he leaned into God. And because he did those things, he was ready for his second chance. And so I'd ask you, are, are you willing to do that kind of work? Are you willing to be self-reflective and to pray and acknowledge God and to lean in and not become bitter? That work is the preparatory work for what God has for you next, your second chance. And so God looks at Jonah and he says, okay, now let's wipe that one off and let's try this again. You've tried the ship, you've tried the tempest, and we made it through the belly of the fish. It's time for a do-over. I want you to see a picture. Any, anybody remember these things? Yeah, that's called an etch-a-sketch. All the old people remember, amen, all right? Kids, let me describe, before TikTok, for fun, when we were kids, we used to grab two knobs and turn them to, to write or draw unrecognizable pictures. <laughs> like, yeah, you'd hear about some crazy artist who drew the perfect Mona Lisa with his etch a sketch. But for the rest of us, a, a random little stair step was all we could manage on this simple little machine. By the way, do you know what they call an etch a sketch in Canada? They're called an iPad. All right, I'm kidding. Here's my point. What, what I remember about these is one of the coolest things about an Etch-A-Sketch was that when you made a mistake, old people, remember, what did you do? You would simply shake that thing. Or sometimes you turn it upside down and you would shake it and your crappy picture went away. You got a clean slate. You got a do-over. And so for Jonah, God wipes the slate clean and he's done it for us so many times. A second chance. Can I just remind us all that we didn't even deserve a first chance with God? Like in his great mercy, he gave us a first chance and we messed that up. And it's so incredibly humbling that God would then turn around and give us a second chance, even after all our running. So the word of the Lord came to Jonah, we saw a second time. Look at verse two, saying, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, it's the same assignment as back in chapter one, word for word. God hasn't moved on. He hasn't changed direction. He doesn't lower the bar. He repeats the exact same call. And I think Jonah may have been hoping that God would have forgotten. Like Jonah's like, maybe that little sea journey and the fish incident distracted God from sending me to those Ninevites, but no such luck. Like guys, have you ever tried this trick with your wife? Like when she's in the middle of telling you all the stuff that you've done wrong and you like try to distract her, you're like, honey, hey, did you see that the, the Hallmark holiday movies are starting back up? And listen, babe, there's nothing that I'd rather do than to curl up in a blanket together with a cup of hot chocolate and to snuggle on the couch while we watch, you know, that small town girl who's with the wrong guy and her life falls apart till she finds the right guy. Like, honey, every part of me wants to make that happen tonight. Has that ever worked for you guys? No. It never worked for me either. It didn't work for Jonah either. God is still on point. God says, arise, go. The, the phrase literally means go now. There's an immediacy and an urgency about it. Like if you started here and then you ran away and now you're back here again and God gives you another chance, you go now. Otherwise, you might talk yourself out of what God wants you to do. And so God comes straight back to the assignment that Jonah said no to. You can't just ignore that place where you disobeyed God. You can't just try to forget about it and move on. See, when it comes to disagreeing with God, God is always right. And guess what? You're always not right. And so God brings Jonah back right to the place where he ran from, and he gives him a chance to make it right. And this is the second way to make good on a second chance. So you can't move forward until you make your no a yes. God's not going to allow you to truly progress, to truly move forward in your life and your calling until you go back to where you said no to him and say yes to him. And he won't always send a whale, by the way. Like sometimes it's just the spirit's still small voice before you go to sleep at night or the name or the face that pops into your head in the middle of the night or the middle of the afternoon, the person you didn't forgive, the person you didn't encourage when God told you to. 
And so that prompting from God that you ignored or or brushed off or, or chalked up to voices in your head, he's giving you a second chance. And so God tells Jonah again to go, go now, which by the way is one of God's favorite commands through the Bible. Unfortunately, many people think that the sum total of the Christian life has less to do with go and more to do with the word stop. Like people think that God mostly wants us to stop doing stuff, stop drinking, stop smoking, stop cussing, stop being selfish, stop getting mad, getting even, stop hanging out with those friends. Trust me, it's critical to put off behaviors that are sinful or harmful. It's so, so important to live a holy life. But following Jesus doesn't begin and end with the word stop. In fact, the heart of following Jesus is the word go. Christian faith is a movement. It's an adventure. It's an outward focus. And I realize our lives can get so busy at times that we forget, but God's command is to go. And in this Transform 1-8 vision that we're in right now as a church, we've been emphasizing this call to go, to be an influence in our relational circles, at our locations, in our city, and in our world. We believe that whole communities can be transformed as we Christians are transformed. But we must remember that at the heart of transformation is the, is the Christian's willingness to go where God calls. This is why God has called and saved Jonah, to go to the Ninevites. And so God says in verse two, there's a message that I'm gonna tell you and your job is to go deliver it. Now I want you to notice the first word of verse three. He says, so Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now, Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days journey in breadth. See that? The first word, so Jonah. Now, this is a contrast to the first time Jonah received this assignment back in chapter one, where God called him to go and preach. And then the Bible said, but Jonah. And and after that, he ran as far away as he could. So so Jonah's making progress because in chapter three, verse three, he chooses to obey. And so he traveled northeast to Nineveh rather than running away this time. This is a positive step for Jonah. He made his no a yes. He got it right. You know, Amidst the the constant struggles that you and I have, there are moments when you get it right. Like moments when you could gossip about that coworker, but you don't. Moments when you could blow up at your spouse, but you take a walk instead. Moments when you might act lustfully or impulsively, but you resist. And in those moments, when we obey, even if it seems small, it pleases God. And I just want to commend some of you today for for just making time for, for church today just watching us today. There are a hundred other things that you could be doing right now. And instead you said, I'm gonna prioritize God. I'm gonna prioritize my faith. And it's the holiest thing you could have done today. So, So good job, I commend you. I believe that God is pleased by that. When we make a no into a yes to God. And so Jonah said yes, and he began his journey to Nineveh. Now listen, as we've said, these were brutal people. And for all Jonah knew, he might end up impaled on a pole or or skinned alive. But he realized that after the wail of an ordeal that he had just come through, you see what I did there, that, that having brutal enemies against you is way better than having God against you. Did you catch that? Having brutal enemies against you is way better than having God against you. And so he would go and he would preach to the most difficult of audiences. See, Nineveh is not just the place that you don't want to go. It's it's also the place that you've decided in your own wisdom that that's simply out of God's reach. And so Jonah was prepared for his do-over. And he went back to that original assignment and he made his Noah yes. Now I want you to see the third lesson in making good on your second chance. It's that you realize that when God does something in you, he wants to do something through you. See, Jonah's redemption happened for the Ninevites' redemption. It wasn't all about Jonah. God had given a message for him to share that would point other people to God. And guess what? He's given you and I the same message. And even in difficult circumstances, we're called to be his mouthpiece. And so who are the people in your life who are impossible to reach? That family member that you've prayed for but never seems to change. It's the colleague who makes jokes about your faith and calls you the crazy Christian behind your back. It's the person that that you try to love but she just responds like a jerk every single time. It's the situation that never seems to get any better for you, where there's no hope at all. And so Jonah is heading into this huge and hopeless city. And in verse four, we see that Jonah began to go into the city. 
Look what it says. He began to go into the city, going a day's journey. He had, so, so he'd been walking all day, and he finally arrives. He, he must have been quite a sight to behold, by the way. He was probably bleached white from all the whale's gastric juices. He looks like you dudes on the beach in the summer. He's so white. He, he's only a little way into the city, and he stops. He's probably already, he can't even make it through the city. He's probably already so frustrated. He's probably seen more sin and evil that can, he can even stomach. And, and he feels very small. This is one man against the world. And so he stops and he gives what may be the shortest sermon in human history. It's eight words long. In fact, it's only five words long if you read it in the original Hebrew. A five word sermon. Some of you are like, if only we could be so lucky. So I want you to look at his sermon here. It's in verse four. Look what he says. And he called out, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That's it. I mean, let's be honest. It's a pretty lame sermon, really. There are no points, no illustrations, no PowerPoint, no funny stories, no scripture verses, nothing. More importantly, it lacks all the characteristic features of what was considered Old Testament prophecy, his job. There's no word from the Lord. There's no naming of sins. There's no appeal for the victims of injustice. And most importantly, there's no, no mention even of God. Now, I don't know if he was scared or unprepared. I, I do know one thing. He was reluctant. He didn't want to do this. He, he didn't even make it to the center of town. He gives this half-hearted sermon, probably getting his, gritting his teeth the whole time. But how many of you are grateful that sometimes God uses reluctant messengers? It doesn't need to be perfect. Listen, it's really important for you to understand this truth, that regardless of your qualifications, when God does something in you, he wants to do something through you. Even if that something is really painful, God never wastes a hurt. So did God bring you through the pain of a divorce or the difficulty of a job loss, maybe a miscarriage? Have you struggled with self-image? Are you going through a, a health scare? Maybe now God wants to use that thing to help someone else. Like he wants to do something through you now that he's done something in you. Look what he did through Jonah's really bad sermon in verse five. It says, and the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and they put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. Did you see that? They believed God. The feeble words of a half-hearted spokesman who had been coerced into being there in the first place. It's crazy. There's a revival breaking out from the lamest sermon in history. And so what made them believe like this? Like Jonah didn't even tell them what to do. He didn't even tell them about their sin. He didn't tell them how to repent. How did this happen? It's simple. The greatness of God. God was already at work. God had gone ahead of Jonah and he had prepared the hearts of the Ninevites. And in a flash, life in Nineveh looked very different. Look what it says. That they all repented from the greatest of them to the least of them. In other words, the whole society was impacted. It wasn't just the orphanages and the homeless shelters, but there was revival among the influencers. Imagine in our country, Jeff Bezos, the LeBron, the Ellen DeGeneres, Harry Styles, Lady Gaga, all the Kardashians, just imagine them repenting before God, covered in sackcloth. Actually, the Kardashians could probably use some additional sackcloth to cover them up, right? But, but imagine these superstars alongside working class people and the poor all bowing down, the greatest to the least, in solidarity and total surrender and repentance before God for the state of their city. Like instead of protests in our streets, imagine revival in our streets. That's what's happening in Nineveh. And so Jonah's message affected the whole society. But not only that, Look at verse six. It says, and the word reached the king of Nineveh and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. The brutal dictator gets off his throne, takes off his royal robes and falls to his knees before the mercy of God. Now, you might be thinking, okay, this is just getting a little ridiculous, but God's just getting started. God didn't, didn't just reach the people. He didn't just reach the greatest and least. And he didn't even just reach the king. God transformed the very laws of the land. Look at verse seven. It says, 
And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles. Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from his violence that, that is in his hands. Who knows, God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. I want you to see a couple things here. The first is that it, it turns out that these people, the Ninevites, aren't monsters. Like it's so easy for us to turn people who are not like us, who voted differently than us, who, who are different from different cultures than us, into monsters. We dehumanize them. We assume the worst about them. That's what Jonah had done. But these Ninevites are just broken people in need of a savior like everybody else. You see, even the most hardened person you know, your enemy, will absolutely melt in the presence of a sovereign God if they get the chance to experience him fully. But I want you to see something else. In these three verses, we get this picture of repentance. And we're supposed to see here that, that these wicked barbarians followed the same pattern of repentance that the Israelites had followed during their own history. That the fact that it included weeping of, of great and small, king and commoner, man and beast, shows us the totality of their repentance. Notice the fasting. Like in the Old Testament, fasting was a symbol of humility and repentance and a desire to see and hear from God. This is still true. Fasting still does this. But what we see here, even the livestock were fasting. Why is that? Well, what, what, what does a cow do when it's hungry? It moos. And if it's really hungry, like if it doesn't eat for a whole day, you can hear the cow's noises growling, you know, from over a half mile away. Those of you who have ever had teenage boys have also experienced this phenomenon. The idea was that, that the mooing of the cows would contribute to the wailing sound of repentance and mourning in the land. They also used sackcloth, which was a material made of goat's hair. It was very coarse material. It's, a, it's the most miserable, coarse, burlap kind of type of material. And so they dressed in this uncomfortable sackcloth because they were saying, we repent. We're not even worthy to wear normal clothes. And so we will ache, we will have continually itchy reminders, like a physical reminder of our sin. And the king went one step further with his decree. He wasn't satisfied with just a symbolic show of patience. He also demands a change of moral behavior. Verse 8, remember, said, let them call out mightily to God. See, until now, the Ninevites had been mighty in their military strength. They'd been mighty in their brutality. They'd been mighty in their riches. And the king says, now we're going to be mighty in our humiliation and repentance. So let everyone turn from his evil ways. This is what repentance means. It's not just words. It's not just an apology. It's a turning away from certain behaviors. So, so there was a massive revival in an impossible situation, which leads the, to the fourth way to make good on your second chance. And it's to realize that God can use your feeblest attempt to do impossible things. Look at verse 10. It says, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of all the disaster he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. <laughs> because of a five-word sermon. Listen, on your very worst day, God's mercy still works. Jonah had experienced it himself when he was at his worst in chapter 2. And now the Ninevites get a taste of the marvelous mercy of God, despite the feeblest attempt of God's prophet. Remember, one of the major themes of Jonah is the greatness of God. And so we saw his greatness over the whale and over the storm. That was just showing off. Here we see the main way that the greatness of God is on display, and it's in how he pursues and forgives sinners. God doesn't delight in judgment. He delights in mercy. And if you give God a chance in your life, he will overwhelm you with his mercy. God didn't want the destruction of Nineveh. He wanted the attention of Nineveh. And once he had their attention, he got to overwhelm them with his grace. And so one of the reasons that God is so great, and, and, and frankly, we are so not, is because of the greatness of his mercy. Like our ability to show mercy to others really stinks sometimes, doesn't it? How many of you who, you know, who have been forgiven so much by God still struggle in, to turn around and to forgive other people for far lesser offenses? 
And we let our own pettiness and our own smallness prevent us from believing that God can reach the unreachable. We serve a God for whom all things are possible. And so often we trade that God in for a God who is small and predictable and very sensible. That's not our God. Guys, God has always been and always will be a God of unexpected grace, of unpredictable mercy and impossible outcomes. And so are you believing God for the impossible? Listen, I'm not going to lie. All all that's happening in our world has knocked us down a peg or two. But we serve a God of the impossible. And I know the stories that we're hearing right now about what God's doing in people's lives all over our country as a result of Grace's ministry. Guys, these stories are incredible. This little slice of God's church here in northwestern Pennsylvania. And we have teams working on innovations with how we will do church in the future that were never possible before all this happened. And I would just ask you on a personal level, where do you need God to do the impossible in your life? Like, is there a relationship that needs healed? A workplace situation that needs resolved? A family circumstance that needs divine intervention? Is there a conversation that needs to be had? Is there a person in your life that needs to hear your faith story? Do you need a miracle in your body? Jonah shouts to us across the ages, don't sell God short. You have no idea of his power if you will simply obey him. Don't keep the grace and the salvation of God to yourself. He can do the impossible. Just stop running. You see, you and I were like Jonah, completely dependent on God for salvation. You you and I were in an impossible situation in our sin, in the belly of a fish. But he has rescued us. He's rescued you now to go and to let others know of the great love of God, to do great things for God, even impossible things. But whatever you do, don't keep that love and grace to yourself. The story of Jonah is supposed to be a living picture for us, a warning even for those who have taken the grace of God and hogged it all for themselves, unwilling to share it with those outside the bounds of who we think God should and shouldn't accept. This story is an indictment of sorts on on those who take the gift of God in salvation and allow it to become a source of pride and judgment of others when it's supposed to be overwhelming them with grace to the point that they have no choice but to share that grace with others who haven't experienced it yet. Anybody ever struggled with this? Anybody ever dropped the light bulb on this sort of thing? Yeah, me too. Praise God that he's a God of second chances. And so today we looked at four ways to make good on a second chance. We said it's important to be prepared for when God gives you a do-over and that you can't move forward until you make your no a yes and that when God does something in you, he wants to do something through you. And fourth, to remember that God can use your feeblest attempt to do impossible things. And so in light of all that, I'm going to ask you to ponder two questions today as my next steps. Here they are. Ask yourself, where is God giving me a second chance? Listen, the Bible's filled with examples of great men and women of God who needed many chances. Think of David, think of Elijah, the nation of Israel, Peter, Paul, Ruth, and Naomi. So so what about you? Is he giving you a second chance with your marriage, with forgiveness? Maybe a second chance to serve him in ministry, to go back to your no and make it a yes, or to volunteer in some way. Maybe a second chance to give and be generous. Maybe you've created a persona on social media that doesn't really reflect you and you need a do-over. Or listen, maybe you squandered a chance to repent before God or a chance to receive his salvation. God is a God of second chances. And if you need a starting place for this, just a practical suggestion, I have one for you. Just start to reflect on God's activity in your life. And I love this little construct that the man used whom Jesus healed from blindness over in John 9, 25. He he said this when he was being confronted. He says, listen, I don't know much about Jesus, but what I do know is that I once was blind and now I see. And so to be able to reflect and to say, I once was this way and now I'm this way or I'm working toward this. This is the language of life change. And if we're living the Christian life, we should be experiencing life change until the day we die. Like if you're not changing, you're not being gripped by the gospel. 
So I, I once was prideful. I once was arrogant or unforgiving. I once was a blamer or a braggart or a drunkard or angry or a workaholic or greedy or self-absorbed. But, but by the mercy of Jesus, here's what he's doing in me. I, I'm learning humility. I'm learning patience. I forgive others now. I'm generous. I serve willingly. I take responsibility. I'm putting my success as a father over my success at my job. You see, when you start reflecting on your life and putting spiritual growth language to your experiences, it's going to help you to frame your faith in such a way that you're able to talk about it with other people. But it's also going to help you to diagnose where you, you might need a second chance. All right, here's the second question to ask. Where do I need to believe God for the impossible? You know, there's a popular phrase that says, I need to see it to believe it. We like to see stuff. We like to see a clear path in our lives. We need everything to make perfect sense to, to, to us. But in regard to our faith, God is honored when we trust him for what we cannot yet see. Even more, to trust him for the impossible. Every step of the way in Jonah's story, God did the impossible. And it's a reminder that your situation, your circumstances, your rocky marriage, your tough friendship, your failing health, your dying dream, they're nothing for God to resurrect. And so will you do a faith building exercise this week and just ask God, where do I need to believe you to do impossible things? And then pray, pray for opportunities. I'm not convinced we're praying big enough prayers. Like I would just ask you, if God answered every prayer that you prayed in the last seven days, how much big stuff would change? Like, would there be any new people in the kingdom? Any miracles? Maybe you're, maybe you're the impossible one who needs changing. Like you feel like you've dropped the light bulb far too many times for God to ever trust you again. I've got good news. Our God is the God of second chances. And when God gives you a second chance, take it. Take it. I love you guys. Don't miss next week as we wrap up this incredible book of Jonah. God bless.